Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Cornelia Davis. I work for Pivotal, uh, and um, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in just a moment. And I'm here with my industry colleague, Ben Stopford, who works for Confluent, and I'll let him introduce himself in just a moment as well. To give you a little bit about my background, I have been with Pivotal since the Pivotal spinoff. I have been in the EMC family of companies now for 20 years, and you might have heard that Pivotal is getting purchased, looks like it's going to get purchased by VMware, so more of the Dell family. Um, so been there for a long time. Uh, have been working in web architectures for 15 or more years. Have been working in cloud native and um, cloud foundry in particular for longer than Pivotal's been existent in existence. I came from the EMC side of the house where I worked in the CTO office doing architecture and emerging tech and started working on cloud foundry back then. Um, the other thing is that I recently published a book. Uh, the book finally published, uh, I wrote, it took me three years to write. It published at the end of May. Um, and so there's that. And you might have noticed that I am wearing a t-shirt with the cover of my book. Thank you, Manning, for the t-shirt. Um, and I will turn around. There's a discount code on the slides that you'll find. But there's also a 50% discount code off the t-shirt. So um, you can come find me afterward. I'm going to wear my t-shirt for the next couple of days. Manning really likes that. So I will hand it over to Ben, and he can introduce himself. You've got the next slide there. Sure. Thanks, Cornelia. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Ben Stofford. Uh, I work at uh, Confluent. Anyone heard of Confluent? It doesn't make wikis. Um, <laughs> that's good. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're the company. If you haven't heard of us, we, we, uh, we sit behind uh, Apache Kafka, which is a, a stream processing uh, framework, it's a sh event streaming platform. Um, yes, yeah, so I, uh, I work in the office of the CTO. I used to work on Kafka, the messaging system. I used to work on Kafka Core. I wrote the uh, latest version of the replication protocol, a few other, a few other things. And uh, um, I worked in a bunch of other companies, mostly in Europe, uh, ThoughtWorks, uh, a few enterprise companies in my year, mostly looking at data. So, it's Super. You. I'll take that. that. You keep that, because I have the lav lavalier. Okay, so, um, oh, and this is the book, of course, that Ben has written yeah, as well. So, um, brought the, the, uh, the picture up there. So, where we're going to go today in the next 25 minutes or so is we're going to talk a little bit about the goodness of microservices. We'll also talk about some of the challenges because those challenges set the stage for what we're going to talk about here with Kafka today. So, it's when we start to look at those challenges that we can really understand the value that Kafka can bring to the microservices-based applications that you all know and love um, and uh, are deploying on, onto Cloud Foundry. And that's really where that how event-driven approaches help. And because we're here at the Cloud Foundry Summit, it's also super relevant to you on, OK, given all of those patterns, we're going to talk about these things more in a kind of pattern-oriented way, then how can you get your hands on this stuff um, to actually start using it in your Cloud Foundry-based environments. So the first thing that I'll start with is I am not going to belabor this point. We all know that microservices are good. It's about loose coupling, loosely coupling teams, loosely coupling pieces of software, all of those things. But we also know that when we start to break apart what used to be monoliths into these microservices, now we have what I, in, what I call in the book Cloud-native architectures are highly distributed and constantly changing. So some, those are some of the things that we'll deal with. So as soon as we have this highly distributed environment, we inherit a whole bunch of other problems that didn't exist when we ran things as monoliths. And this is one of the more famous um, you know, headline blog posts here that say, OK, when you take on those microservices, you take on all of these other responsibilities, and you need to be you know, so tall to ride the ride. And so you need to deal with some of those things. So for example, what we have here is not my slide. It's a picture from a uh, presentation that has been done by Scott Mansfield from Netflix. And what we have here on the left-hand side is home page request comes in. And what you see is the cascading requests that go down to downstream microservices. It goes down to hundreds of microservices in that entire tree. Now, 
Let's assume for a moment that each one of the nodes, each one of the microservices, has about five nines of availability. That is, it's available 99.999% of the time. That's pretty good. Now, I'm going to make a super simplifying assumption and say, let's also assume that the network is reliable. So, the network is always there. Yeah, right. Well, even with that simplifying assumption, which we know is not the case, by the time we get down to the home page request, we've lost two nines of availability. We've gone from 99.999 to 99.9. .9, and that starts counting as real money. So that's just an example of some of the problems that microservices bring in. So how do we try to add a level of resilience to these microservice-based architectures? Well, that's what I wrote the book about. That's what Cloud, Cloud Native Patterns is about, is all of these different patterns that we put in place to try to um, take, you know, to, uh, to account for and, and um, adapt to these things like network outages. So for example, retries is one. When you are browsing the web as a human and you click on a link and the page doesn't render, do you give up and go to a different page? Maybe. I hear somebody say, yep. But most of the time you hit refresh first, right? You're doing a retry. Well, we implement retries within the architecture as well so that if the client doesn't hear back, we're going to do a retry. But then we have to deal with things like timeouts. How long do I wait? How impatient am I as a client before I hit the retry button? And there's all sorts of things. Now take that same picture and add a level of scale. And now we've got multiple clients and they're all doing retries, which you end up with down at the service end is you could end up with a retry storm. And in fact, the first, first four words in my book are, it's not Amazon's fault. And I go on and talk about an Amazon outage that they had that essentially was a retry storm, and an inadvertent retry storm. So we do things like we add circuit breakers so that the service itself doesn't get overloaded with retry storms. Another pattern that we use to adapt to this, the, these challenges with distributed systems is we stick caches in place. So when I make a downstream request, when I do get a successful response, I'm going to save that result just in case the next time I ask, I don't get back a response, maybe I can use that cache data instead. Well, as usual, you inherit some challenges. Oh, didn't talk about those. As usual, you inherit some challenges, which are things like, how fresh is the cache? How do I know when the cache needs to be updated? So those are a set of things, but there's actually even more when it comes to that. So what we did when we went from monoliths to microservices is we have all these loosely coupled pieces, right? Not so much. Because a lot of times we have all these loosely coupled components that are all tied to the same monolithic database. So it's just an illusion of loose coupling. So the way that we've started to talk about this in the industry is we said, OK, well, then each microservice gets its own storage. It gets its own database. But now you have a whole other set of problems, which are, well, where's the source of truth? How do I reconcile if that database in the upper right-hand corner has a customer record and a customer email? How do I reconcile that with the customer email that's down here in the lower left-hand corner? So these are all of the different types of challenges. And it turns out that there are some key patterns that come to the rescue of cache um, freshness of monolithic databases. And that's where I'd like to hand things over to my colleague to talk about some of those patterns. Now, by the way, when we talked about that Netflix case, we assumed something. Most microservice architectures assume a request response style. That is, a request comes into a root of a whole bunch of cascading requests going down, and then we get back those responses and return the response to the user. What I'm going to suggest to you 
is that you need to start thinking about going instead of from the root out to the leaves, think about going from the leaves to the root. Ooh, that's kind of different. And that's what my colleague is going to talk about. Thank you. That could have been embarrassing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I really like this, uh, this, is, this analogy which uh, Cornelia uses. Um, it's, it's a really good one. I, I really like uh, this idea of like, all your microservices are, are leaves, and you can either sit at the root and, and like command them or pull data from them. Or alternatively, you can let the leaves, like, let data flow to you. And that's where, uh, where, where event streaming comes in. And actually, in most big systems I see, you want to use both of these uh, for, different, for different use cases. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of those patterns, but just to, to kind of get started, let's look at the most familiar one, uh, which is the request response one. You, you guys will all be familiar with this. So I've, I've um, I'm going to use this little example. This is one of Cornelia's examples uh, with this little abundant sunshine website. Uh, this is just like a, a little social network. And uh, you've got like a, a user, you have um, a various different, uh, you can befriend other users. Uh, you can like post things, write little blog posts, and when the web page comes up for the first time, it has a nice little timeline. So very much like Twitter or Facebook or one of these things, you get like a timeline that tells you what other people are doing, what other, th other people are posting. So if we build a system like that from a request response uh, paradigm, we kind of make a request to this homepage service, and then that might call out to the friend service, and it would look up who your friends are. Right? So we might have like some database tables for users and who follows who. And then that will return back like, uh, yeah, who your friends are. And then you might make a request passing your friends to the blog post service. This is going to work out what all the, the most recent blog posts are from your various friends. You can send that back to the homepage service. And then you can construct the timeline and display it back on the screen. So that's pretty intuitive, right? Everyone should understand that. And then, as Cornelia said, we, we probably add a bit of caching, right? Because we don't want to do these requests all the time. People tend to like hit F5 a lot or uh, keep refreshing their, their home page. So we'll probably add a bit of caching in to do that. And there are some problems associated with that, with that which we talked about earlier. Or oh, Cornelia did. So let's try to look at the event-driven approach. So with the event-driven approach, you actually need another piece of infrastructure. You need something like Kafka. It doesn't actually have to be Kafka. It could be any message broker. But Kafka has some um, quite useful properties. It, has a, uh, it, it can support like very high scale. So you can actually run like a massive... Uh, installations with hundreds of machines uh, doing very high throughput use cases like uh, absorbing data from mobile phones and things like that. Or you can use it for like a very small use cases. Um, it can store data, which is actually very unusual. Uh, it's actually like a, a storage system as well as a messaging system. So uh, there are clusters out there with hundreds of terabytes of data in a single topic. So they're very different to the messaging systems uh, or that, that sort of came before it. And it has some other things like a uh, uh, the ability to replay these messages, and then advanced features like stream processing, which we'll, we're just going to touch on today, but not too much. So the core point here is that I can take a service, and I can, instead of calling out to another service, I'm actually just going to publish an event. An event is just something that happened. So for example, um, I might publish a new blog post, and that would be sent as a message to a topic of interest, something that you're interested in and somebody else can subscribe to, something, something like blog posts. And another microservice can literally just choose whether or not it wants to subscribe to that stream of events. So this is actually a bit like an email, it's like publish, subscribe, very like a sort of group email address. Like publishing something to this like topic, which is like a group email address, different people can decide whether or not they want to listen to that information or not. But also the data is stored, and we'll come back to why that's important later. So if we put that into our little example, our friend service in now is actually going to start publishing events. So every time you like, uh, add a new friend, you're going to get a new friend event. And that's going to get published to the friendships topic. Likewise, whenever you create a new blog post, there's going to be another event. It's going to be emitted by this service into Kafka on the blog post topic. And different services can subscribe to these streams of events and, get, and find out about what's happening right now. So what does this mean for our little example? So we have this home page service. And uh, previously, we had like a, a little cache for cache requests. Now we're going to change that into uh, what we tend to call a materialized view. There's not actually a great name for this, so we tend to use the term materialized view. And what that really means is we're going to take these events, which are flying through this sort of data background, and we're going to subscribe to them, take the bits we're interested in, and effectively store them in a way that's going to make them kind of read-optimized. So in this case, the homepage service is going to 
filter these events out and create a little data model which exactly matches this timeline. And this is actually a very efficient way of doing this. So this is a bit like a cache, but instead of expiring, it's constantly being updated with events which are flowing through the system. So it's always up to date. There's no like, let you know, concept of, of expiry. It's just like a, a replica, a continuous query of, 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 of the information which is coming out of these other services. So now we can do this uh, very quickly. In fact, uh, this is kind of how Twitter works. Uh, its timeline feature does this for performance reasons. So that's uh, the core of event-driven uh, programming. Well, certainly it's a pattern which is called event uh, carried state transfer. That's what Martin Fowler called it many years ago. But it also relates to another pattern. Who's heard of event sourcing? A few of you. Okay, so this, this is like a, a, another way of, uh, of modeling data in a system. And it's a bit different also from like, the traditional way of doing things. So if you apply event sourcing, which again, it's just a pattern, then the main thing is you make events your data model. So those events, which are being sent out from very dif different services, which are actually representing real world facts. They're literally just what's happening in the real world, right? Somebody befriends someone else, somebody creates a blog post, et cetera, et cetera. These real world facts, we're gonna use those facts as our data model. So why is that a bit different? Well, to see why it's different, we have to take like, we'll take like a trivial example. This is one of the common ones that's used. It's a, think about a, uh, uh, a shopping cart. So maybe like you're buying something from Amazon or whatever and you have like a little shopping cart and you're like building it up with, with uh, things that you want to buy. So Bob here has got like a, a pair of trousers, a jumper, and a hat. And we have like maybe a little database table in a CRUD model where we're gonna increment how many things he's got in his, uh, his shopping basket. And that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, that all works. But if we use events as the data model, we get something slightly different. So in the event-based data model, we'd actually follow exactly what happened in the real world. So what actually happened was Bob added two pairs of trousers. He then added a jumper. He then removed a pair of trousers because he realized he didn't really want to buy two pairs of trousers. Uh, he then added a hat and then he checked out. So this at the, the events actually map the user journey. And this is important because the events are truthful. They represent exactly what happens in the real world. Whereas this view is a little bit lossy. So event sourcing is about storing data as events in the knowledge you can always transform back and get this view, right? You can always derive this one from this one, but not the other way around. So, if we go back to our little example, our materialized view is really uh, a representation of these events. And it's a projection. Kafka's got, like, has effectively the source of truth. It's truthful because it's capturing exactly what happened in the real world. And we're doing the projection inside this materialized view simply so that we can do the thing that we need to do inside the homepage service, which is display this timeline. Now this is a, actually, a, this pattern is a, a, it's actually called CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and it's just like a variant of event sourcing. So, because Kafka can be used as a storage system, we can actually store the events in Kafka for as long as we want. And, we can define our view, that projection that turns the event-based view into the view which suits our service, inside our service, and then we can query this read-optimized view. So this is like a, that read-optimized cache. And this could actually be a database, it could be a hash map in memory, it could be uh, something like Redis, like Twitter uses Redis. Um, but yeah, there are lots of, there are like lots of options. The, co the, co the core point is that um, inside this view, we tend to be uh, read optimized, or at least something that very much suits the way that we want to read data. So, the, yeah, so the events are stored, uh, yeah, are stored inside uh, this Kafka, inside Kafka, and we derive, or maybe rederive, the view from those stored event streams. So if we store the data in Kafka, we can throw this view away, let's say it's just a hash map in memory, or maybe like a, a, a cache, and rederive it from scratch. And that's kind of interesting because if we change our data model, we can then, uh, it's very easy for us to just reinflate a new data model from the underlying like, stream of events because that's what actually happened in the real world. So the reason this becomes uh, interesting is that we can then start apply the, applying this to whole microservice ecosystems. And uh, the reason the pattern works quite well is because different microservices tend to want to do different things with data. So the home page 
Right? It just wants to create a timeline. That's all it wants to do. It doesn't care about maybe like old posts. Uh, maybe it doesn't care too much about uh, information about the user particularly. It just wants to display posts. But we might have like a, another service which is maybe op op um, optimizing the uh, sales conversion rate. Uh, that might be very interested in, in more data. Or we might have a recommendation system um, which wants to recommend you different types of posts. Um, these are all going to have like different data models, but they're always going to go back uh, to that underlying core set of, of uh, truthful events. So just to kind of summarize this bit, there are really two patterns going on here. The first pattern is the event source architecture. And that's where we're retaining our events in Kafka, and we're using those events, that store of events, to re-derive a view. Maybe when the application starts up, uh, maybe just periodically, um, or maybe uh, really at, at any frequency we want. And then there's the event-driven architecture. The event-driven architecture, we don't need to store the data. Right? We can just say, actually, we're going to put our data in a database inside each microservice, and we're just going to use the stream of events to keep it up to date. Both patterns are equally valid. So finally, I'm just going to talk uh, a little bit about event streaming. So if we take those examples, um, we can actually uh, extend the same kind of concepts of having different microservices set uh, around our architecture with different views, different views on the same underlying facts. Um, and we can represent this in a stream processor. And um, we often do this for kind of offline activities that, uh, yeah, we, we want to, where we want things to react in real time. So we want a process to happen continuously. This is less commonly used for user interfaces. So let's say we have a recommendation service. The recommendation service um, actually wants to uh, tell you more, what you might want to read next. So we can make this contextual, right? So uh, let's say uh, you're browsing the Absolute Sunshine website. Uh, you look at various different posts. And we might have a stream of, of uh, a click stream of page views. So we might look at like the, the previous three posts that you've, looked, that, that, uh, that you've read. Um, let's say the last three posts were on Cloud Foundry. Well, maybe we want to recommend you some, uh, some other Cloud Foundry posts. So maybe we want to recommend you a post which uh, your friends have really liked and they spent time reading uh, that were on the same subject. So we might have like a little machine learning algorithm which uh, allows us to sort of drive that. And we take in three streams of events, page views, which would be like what people are doing, and obviously uh, the friendships uh, and the blog posts, event streams. And the interesting thing about using, about doing this in a streaming way is we can do something like Kafka Streams or Alternative KSQL to wrap up the concept of events that are happening in real time and tables and process them as a sort of continuously evolving program. And Kafka Streams is just a library. You can, uh, you can use it uh, standalone. Um, you can use it inside Spring. Um, it allows you, gives you tools for joining real-time event streams, tables, and also summarizing streams, so that you have like a, uh, you can take a, uh, you can, yeah, summarize something into some um, uh, page views, maybe into like views per hour or something like that. So that's how you can kind of build a, a recommendation system, very very simply, and then you could push the result back into another topic, which might, might be used by another microservice. So just a little bit on event streaming. And I'm going to hand back over to Cornelia to uh, finish up. OK, excellent. I will take that. You need that one, <laughs> All right. So to sum it up, first of all, I have to say that I love the distinction of <clears throat> excuse me, those three different patterns that Ben just talked about. There's the event driven, which just that, that is very similar to messaging. There's the event sourcing, which is now the event stream, or the events are themselves a source of truth. And then there's the streaming, which is, OK, now that I've got this whole series of events, can I process wind windows of that? Those three patterns are just so incredibly powerful when we do things like turn this whole thing on its head. Instead of going root to leaf, go leaf to root. Those are three key, key patterns for that. So to sum it up, the interesting thing is that we can take a look at this evolution of different architectures. You know, we used to have this monolithic architecture where we had all of the app logic in one big piece tied to a database. 
Then we started to break that up. That was the picture I showed you earlier. Single database, a whole bunch of seemingly um, autonomous components. Then we started to say, well, actually, let's break up the data tier. But as soon as we broke up the data tier, we needed to address what we do in terms of logically having one body of data, but actually breaking that up into several components. And that's where the Kafka um, and the patterns that Ben talked about come in. Now, if we take that picture and we say, how does that actually work in the Cloud Foundry setting? This is pretty high level and abstract. So I'm going to click to get to the next level of detail, which is, in fact, it is the applications, not the databases themselves, not the local databases, but the applications that are connecting to Kafka. What do we call that Kafka in the Cloud Foundry setting? It's a service, right? It's a service that we bind to. So here we have the service, the Kafka service itself. And then we also have to deal with how do we do those bindings? So what we want to tell you about is a couple of very concrete components that are available to you today, albeit some of them not quite GA. One of them, I believe, is coming GA in Spring One platform in, in just a few weeks. We want to tell you about those. So first, I'll have Ben talk about the first of those, which is how can you actually get the Kafka service itself running in a Cloud Foundry environment? Yeah, sure. So there's, uh, uh, there's yeah, a nice little tool. It's called Confluent Operator. And uh, this basically uh, automates the process of, of managing Kafka for you uh, inside Kubernetes. Um, so you can automate Kafka, Zookeeper, Connect, Schema Registry, which like holds schemas, KSQL, which is a stream processor, and Replicator, which basically ties different Kafka clusters together. And uh, the operator itself uh, has a bunch of features. Obviously, it helps you with the whole problem of deployment, but actually, probably most of the smarts uh, are really in keeping the thing running. So let's say you want to do something like a, a rolling bounce, right? So you want to be able to restart your cluster in a way where it's always on. Um, it's able to do operations like that, knowing that you're not going to lose any data or sacrifice ordering guarantees, that, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, you can do the other things like a scale, uh, install, uninstall, all these, all these kind of things. Um, and you can download it there. Excellent. Thank you. And then the other half of that picture, that previous picture, was in the bindings. So if you're deploying your applications onto Cloud Foundry, you want to be able to bind. Now, if you notice what Ben talked about was he talked about the actual running of that service. So how you can instantiate it, how you can do day two operations, all running on top of Kubernetes. But what is it that we need to be able to bind? A service broker, right? So there's a service broker that's coming out called the Container Service Manager. Um, that's what the KSM stands for. And what that is, is it's developed by Pivotal. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to bring operators, like the, the Confluent operator, that deploy services on top of Kubernetes. And it allows you to register those things inside of your Cloud Foundry services catalog. So here's a picture of what that looks like. I won't go through it in detail. But what you can see here, basically, is that the platform team, who we call Alana here, is going to be able to install the Confluent operator. First of all, they're installing KISM. Then they're installing the Confluent operator into that broker. That has the effect of making that available as a marketplace offering in Cloud Foundry where Cody can just do a CF create service. That CF create service will then result in having the operator get deployed onto the Kubernetes environment of your choice. We've shown a couple here, PKS as well as GKE. And then the service is available for you to bind to, to apply those patterns of event driven or event sourcing or event streaming. So that wraps up the picture. And unbelievably, I have 40 seconds left, or we have 40 seconds left. So I think we have time for maybe one question. Any questions on that? Yes. Um, so you brought up the question, or you brought up the problem um, on having many sources of truth and not being able to go into one. And I see how event sourcing could solve that problem where Kafka is the source of truth. Um, but for the other 
prior to um, entering in and then streaming, uh, I wonder how you address that problem. So, so the yeah, it's a really good question actually. Um, so yeah, the, I mean the question is really like a how uh, in event streaming. Um, and, and event-driven, how? What, what, what is your source of truth? Like, how do you not have this uh, data divergence problem? And um, actually, event streaming and uh, the event sourcing are actually pretty closely linked. So, uh, event streaming tends to use event sourcing just implicitly. Um, it just turns out it evolved that way in a different field, basically. Um, but yeah, the, the main thing is that uh, you actually still have one source of truth um, in, in, in all of those patterns. Um, the T typical event-driven pattern, which has been around for a long time, doesn't actually really address it in the same way. Um, it doesn't give you that much more. It decouples, but uh, you actually have like still have like many different copies of your data around the place. The main thing which both um, the event sourcing and the event streaming patterns do is uh, they keep you closer to that source of truth because um, you tend to, to write your code in a way that your data, your copy, the copy that's inside your microservice, it can always be re-derived from the, that, that source of truth. It's not the same thing, because you're, you're keeping yourself one step away from it, but you're, you're always able to re-derive. So it's actually very similar to the way you do kind of like infrastructure as code. It's very much like a, it's more like sort of the same kind of principle of saying, well, actually, I've got this data, it's, it's as events, and I have some code which turns that data into the data that I actually use. And for data that comes from other services, that kind of declarative approach how I'm going to represent this, this source, of, source of truth data, but in my own microservice. And that's kind of what makes it work. So it's kind of like a balance. Yeah. And I'll add to that that the short answer is it's not easy. Um, and what we've done over the course of the last 20, 30 years is if, you, you, if you've heard terms like um, uh, master data management, uh, those types of things, those are the approaches that we used before. And it's extraordinarily complex. Um, because you do have to decide, where is my source of truth? And then you also have to deal with the other complexity that comes in, is that if I want to write to one of my local databases, how do I do synchronization in multiple directions? So the answer is it's super hard, and it's very brittle, and it's not agile at all, and which is why we're moving into event sourcing type of patterns. So. Um, I think with that, we have to close up. And uh, I am, Ben is leaving this afternoon, so if you want to snag him sometime this afternoon would be good. I'm around at the conference uh, through tomorrow, so if you have any questions, you can certainly find me in the hallways and happy to have more chats. So thanks so much for your attention. Thanks, everyone.